Hello again. Welcome back to week 44 of year three of the Religious Education Initiative. This is day two. We're continuing our way through the Epistle of St. Clement to the Church of Corinth. So last time we saw St. Clement outline to the Christians in Corinth the entire history of the people of God from the very beginning through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even to their own calling, the Church of Corinth's own calling as God's faithful people, reminding them of the truth that God has not chosen any of us because of our own honor or wisdom or strength, but rather he has called us in our lowliness and weakness to be renewed by his work in us and on our behalf. This time he will continue the theme and remind them and us that everything we are is God's workmanship. So this is chapter 33. What shall we do then, brethren? Shall we become slothful in well-doing and cease from the practice of love? God forbid that any such course should be followed by us, but rather let us hasten with all energy and readiness of mind to perform every good work. For the Creator and Lord of all himself rejoices in his works. For by his infinitely great power he established the heavens, and by his incomprehensible wisdom he adorned them. He also divided the earth from the water which surrounds it and fixed it upon the immovable foundation of his own will. The animals also which are upon it he commanded by his own word into existence. So likewise when he had formed the sea and the living creatures which are in it, he enclosed them within the proper bounds by his own power. Above all, with his holy and undefiled hands, he formed man, the most excellent of his creatures, and truly great through the understanding given him, the express likeness of his own image. For thus says God, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God made man, male and female he created them. Having thus finished all these things, he approved them and blessed them and said, increase and multiply. We see then how all righteous men have been adorned with good works, and how the Lord himself, adorning himself with his works, rejoiced. Having therefore such an example, let us without delay accede to his will, and let us work the work of righteousness with our whole strength. The good servant receives the bread of his labor with confidence. The lazy and slothful cannot look his employer in the face. It is requisite, therefore, that we be prompt in the practice of well-doing, for of him are all things. And thus he forewarns us, Behold, the Lord comes, and his reward is before his face, to render to every man according to his work. He exhorts us, therefore, with our whole heart to attend to this, that we be not lazy or slothful in any good work. Let our boasting and our confidence be in him. Let us submit ourselves to his will. Let us consider the whole multitude of his angels, how they stand ever ready to minister to his will. For the scripture says, Ten thousand times ten thousand stood around him, and thousands of thousands ministered to him and cried, Holy, 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 the Lord of Sabaoth, the whole creation is full of his glory. And let us therefore conscientiously gathering together in harmony cry to him earnestly as with one mouth, that we may be made partakers of his great and glorious promises. For the scripture says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which he has prepared for those who wait for him. How blessed and wonderful, beloved, are the gifts of God, life in immortality, splendor in righteousness, truth in perfect confidence, faith in assurance, self-control in holiness, and all these fall under the cognizance of our understandings now. What then shall those things be which are prepared for such as wait for him? The Creator and Father of all worlds, the Most Holy, alone knows their amount and their beauty. Let us therefore earnestly strive to be found in the number of those who wait for him, in order that we may share in his promised gifts. But how, beloved, shall this be done, if our understanding be fixed by faith towards God? if we earnestly seek the things which are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things which are in harmony with his blameless will, and if we follow the way of truth, casting away from us all unrighteousness and iniquity, along with all covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering and evil speaking, all hatred of God, pride and haughtiness, vainglory and ambition. 
For they that do such things are hateful to God, and not only they that do them, but also those who take pleasure in those who do them. For the scripture says, But to the sinner God said, Why do you declare my statutes and take my covenant into your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and made your portion with adulterers. Your mouth has abounded with wickedness and your tongue contrived deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought, wicked one, that I should be like you. But I will reprove you and set yourself before you. Consider now these things, you who forget God, lest he tear you in pieces like a lion, and there be none to deliver. The sacrifice of praise will glorify me, and a way is there by which I will show him the salvation of God. Okay, now last time we really thought we had gotten to the end of St. Clement's prelude. He ended with that doxology saying, To whom be glory forever and ever, amen, which sounds like a real end point to the introduction, and now he's beginning his actual point. But he doesn't seem to be beginning his actual point. Uh, I will say, though, he is. He is beginning it with this exhortation, and he starts that way. What shall we then do, brethren? Shall we be slothful in well-doing? Right. So now he's talking directly to them. He's beginning his exhortation, but he's beginning it by recapping everything that he's said before, because he's recapping it by saying, God has made all things, and he's made us after his image, and he's given us instructions. So, you know, it sounds like what he said before. And then he continues saying, so he's given us instructions. The good servant receives the reward for doing well. The evil, lazy, slothful servant can't even look at the Lord. So he's warning them. He's saying, you know, if we do good, then we will do well. If we do badly, then things won't go well. So let's attend to the work that God has given to us. Let's not be lazy and slothful. And if we want to boast, if we want to have confidence, we need to submit ourselves to God's will. And then he gives the example of the angels, all the angels in obedience to God. This sets something up that we're going to see next time because not all the angels were obedient. But we're not there yet. We're still laying the groundwork. We're preparing for this. And then he finally says, so all the gifts of God are wonderful. What we receive from God if we work in faithfulness, our eternal life, splendor and righteousness, truth and confidence, faith and assurance, self-control and holiness, all of this we understand. We see this now, he says. And if we see this now, when we still live in this troubled world, what will be revealed to us when the Lord fulfills and heals and perfects all things? Only God himself, the Father of all things, knows what we are waiting for. So, Let's wait in the number of those who wait for him so that we're sure to take part in these good things. And then he says, so how do we do this? How do we do this? What shall we do? He's still talking about this. What now shall we do, having beheld this beautiful order of the church and of all creation with, that God has called us to? He says, well, we do everything in harmony with him. We seek what is pleasing to him. We cast away unrighteousness and iniquity. We avoid all the sins, covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering, evil speaking, hatred of God, pride and haughtiness, vainglory, and ambition. All of these later things now are the sins that he is writing to the church in Corinth about. He's warming to his topic. He has not yet pointed the finger and said, and you are committing these things. He's not yet condemning them. He's giving them the opportunity. He's giving them the warning. He's warming them up so that when the word of condemnation comes, they may be already prepared to say, no, we have rejected that. No, we will not side with them. No, we will not go along with this rebellion. No, we will be faithful to God. And 
Yes. So, and, and then he, the, the, this, this final paragraph is really the, the quoting the majority of, of a psalm. Uh, I remember which one, but I have to remind myself. Uh, it should be Psalm chapter 49. Yes, it's, it's the, the 49th Psalm. Uh, he's quoting a Psalm, he's quoting this prayer saying, there is a sacrifice of praise, that is what glorifies God, and there is a way by which I will show the salvation of God. So, uh, we're warming up. Next time, I think we will actually begin to get some hard, clear statements of this is how the church ought to be, this is what you have broken, this is what you must return to. We should read this not just as a curiosity, though, about the church in Corinth, because it's not as though our nature has changed. It's not as though, as though the things to which we are tempted in our life as Christians in a church community have changed. It's not as though there is less dissension and division and strife and ambition and pride and evil speaking in the church now than there was in the church in Corinth. This is for all of us to read with care, with caution, with repentance, with self-reflection, and with humility, so that we see the sins in which we have partaken, so that we see the sins of which we need to repent, so that we see the way in which we are called, and may respond to that call before the word of judgment comes. Uh, Clement is being very like God himself in his writing. He takes a very long time before he speaks a word of condemnation. We haven't got there yet. Uh, so we'll see what happens next time. For now, God bless you all. We'll see you next time.